Well, we're studying the book called Vayakara, which in the Hebrew means, and he called. It comes from the first few words of the book. In other words, it is a book that's really labeled the called. And uh, if you're in Christ, then you are the called, Paul would tell you in Romans 8.28, remember? For all things work together for good to them who are the called, according to his word and so on. It's an incredible book. Um, I'm always reminded of the insight that Socrates himself, one of the Greek, highly venerated Greek thinkers, he said, it may be that deity can forgive sins, but I don't see how. And that remark that he did 500 years B.C. was uh, very, very perceptive. He recognized the contradiction of a holy God who could not violate his righteousness forgiving sins. But the answer to that, of course, is given by John the Baptist in the early first chapter of the Gospel of John, where he introduces Jesus Christ. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's God's climactic plan through all the universe. And it's interesting to discover that the book of Leviticus, every detail of it, points to that. In some way, all these rituals, all these things we're going to look at in one way or another illuminate the implications of what God did for you and I and for himself on that cross. Just as we have a predicament, God had one too. It's interesting that uh, this book, Leviticus, is so widely ignored by Christians. We study the New Testament. Those of us that graduate and get some founding in the Old Testament, even then, still tend to skip over this book of ancient rituals and what have you. And yet Paul includes it in his observation where he says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through the comfort and uh, patience of the Scriptures might have hope. It's in that spirit that we jump in. It's interesting that the Lord himself makes an allusion to this in effect. Remember when he pointed out that man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Here is a book that is almost totally a direct Transcription of what God told Moses. So th- all through the Bible we have prophets telling us this, that, and the other thing and so forth. Here we have God telling Moses. That's, that's the way the book presents itself. And it deals with the very core of God's plan. Every detail does. And of course this, the first thing we encounter in this book are the sacrifices. Again, we tend to uh, so easily dismiss these as ancient rituals. But uh, uh, these sacrifices codified, of course, the... Uh, Levitical system in the Torah. They were instituted, I believe, as early as when? Garden of Eden. Yes, I believe these, when when Adam and Eve were uh, expelled from the garden, God made a provision for their sin, even then, when he took away the the coats of fig leaves and gave them coats of skins, teaching them that by the shedding of innocent blood, they would be covered. And you can't infer that just from that little allusion there in Genesis 3.21, but as you read the rest of the Torah and come back to that, you realize it's all part of the plan. And in fact, unless you understand that, the following chapter, you know, Adam's fall is in chapter 3 of Genesis, in chapter 4, this whole business between Cain and Abel hangs on the fact that Abel gave an offering in accordance to the specifications. We get, we get uh, sidetracked because we know that Abel was a shepherd and the other was a, and Cain was a, uh, you know, a, a farmer. And that wasn't the issue. The issue was that Abel gave an offering as God had specified. And Cain was giving him an offer, uh, offering of uh, the fruits of, of his labor from a cursed ground. And uh, that created the tension, which, of course, resulted in that murder. But uh, one of the key verses in the book of Leviticus we'll be confronted with again and again and again uh, is uh, summarized in Leviticus 17.11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is that blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The word atonement, widely misunderstood, it is. It really means to cover, not to remove. 
The word atonement occurs 45 times in this book. Let's not confuse the atoning blood on that altar with the, uh, the that. Don't confuse that with what it really points to. The only offering that can uh, make uh, provide for the remission of sins is is the uh, blood of Jesus Christ, and this is it. It affects because God is in effect able to look at that in anticipation of the cross. Blood is the forfe- is blood is the uh, substance of life, and sin is the forfeiture of life. So the shedding of blood is just intimately tied up in its significations with with uh, uh, the the sin problem. The shedding of innocent blood itself couldn't change a person's heart, and that's really what it's about. And he and the, the shedding of uh, this, uh, the blood of bulls and goats does not take away sin. And Hebrews chapter ten is your commentary on this whole area. But God did state that the sins of the worshiper offering these offerings um, would be forgiven, and He says that all through uh, in in in, in, uh, in uh, Leviticus. In chapter four, He mentions it one, two, three, four times, and in in uh, chapter five, He mentions it four times, and so forth. Um, but He does this on the basis of an anticipation of the sacrifices of Jesus on the cross. Now six. Different specific offerings could be brought to the altar. In fact, if you go into some Jewish encyclopedias, they really uh, list uh, almost 20 of them, but most of them are just very slight variations of a basic six. Each one of these six different offerings will instruct us, will teach us something distinctive uh, and essential about Christ and his sacrifice in your behalf and mine. Every one of these offerings speaks to implications of the cross. They can be classified, as I think, just to review from last time, in three categories. The first category deals with the commitment to God. And your first reaction is, well, it speaks of our commitment to God. Yes, it can, but the primary thing is it demonstrates or it speaks to Christ's commitment to the mission for his Father. The burnt offering, the greater meal offering, and the drink offering are in that category. They speak of total dedication to the Lord. And that has two elements, of course, that Christ was our example in terms of his total commitment to his mission. And, of course, as as we worship, that also teaches us something about what real consecration is all about. So the first three of the six speak of our commitment to God the next one is called the fellowship offering, often called the peace offering. Some of the names that we uh, label these with from the King James translations are not as descriptive as we might like. When we speak of the meat offering, that's what King James' term for meat really meant meal or grain offering. So we have the burnt offering and the what I'll call the grain offering or meal offering, called meat offering in the King James, and the drink offering. Those three offerings are um, dealing with our commitment to the Lord. The communion with God is the peace offering, or more pro- better called the fellowship offering. We'll deal with that, of course, when we get there. And then the last two, again, are uh, the sin offering and the guilt offering, or trespass offerings, it's called, the King James. We'll obviously take each one of these uh, as we go through the first seven chapters. But we're going to start with the most basic of them all, the most frequent of them all. The most fundamental one, obviously, is the burnt offering, as it's called. It's the oldest offering known to man. It was the offering that Abel, Noah, and Abraham are recorded as an offering. It's mentioned first in Leviticus because of its prominence and its priority. It's the only offering made by those who wanted to approach God. It's called the Ola in Hebrew, which means that which ascends. Its distinctive aspect is that it was totally consumed and went up in smoke it literally <laughs> it literally went up in smoke we use that as an expression and it fits this perfectly it was totally consumed nothing remained but ashes it's the only one of that kind see this is it also um, reveals what god sees in christ in leviticus Chapter 1, verse 9, 13, and 17, the sacrifice is described as a sweet savor unto the Lord. A sweet-smelling savor. Literally, by the way, it's translated, uh, 
it's a sweet smelling savor is in your King James. It literally means a, a, a savor of rest, a soothing, uh, quieting, tranquilizing scent, uh, fragrance or aroma, which stays his wrath and calms his soul, is sort of the image it's presenting. And uh, that's exactly what Paul picks up in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. He says, and he advocates that we walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Same, same idea there. We find that same expression used after Noah's flood when the, 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 there was a rest described in Genesis 8.21. The flood of Noah is really worth studying in this regard because um, it's interesting to focus for a moment on the time that the flood ended. The flood ended in, in uh, Genesis 8 verse 4 on the 17th day of the seventh month. And it's one of those strange details the Holy Spirit puts there. Why? Well, if you do your homework, you discover that Jesus Christ, the, uh, when he was resurrected, that was our new beginning. God had a new beginning on the planet Earth under when the at the after the flood of Noah, and he has, and we have a new beginning in Christ on the on the resurrection day. That's why we we choose to worship on Sunday. Well, it's interesting that that Sunday morning was the seventeenth of Nisan, which is the seventh month of the old calendar. In Exodus twelve, God gives them a new calendar. It has them make the seventh month of Nisan being the the uh, the first month of the it becomes thus the Jews Jews really have two calendars the original calendar which is what I'll call the Genesis calendar in which it it starts at Rosh Hashanah uh, in the fall in the uh, first of Tishri but the seventh month is Nish, is Nisan and that's the the month of Passover that's and they're instructed to make that the first month it, when you go through all that it turns out that the flood of Noah came to an end on the anniversary in advance of our new beginning in Christ. And when you discover those little things, you begin to realize the integrity of design in the Scripture. In any case, uh, a sweet savor, a sweet-smelling savor. That's God saying, in effect, that He's satisfied with what Jesus did for your sins and mine. He paid it all. He can save you to the uttermost by that sacrifice. The question is, it's satisfying God. Is it satisfying to us? Do we want to add something to that? Are we really satisfied with that is the issue. Now, the whole sacrifice had to involve death. It was not the spotless life of Christ and our approval of Him that saves us. Only His death can do that. And this is the very definition of the gospel. We use that term gospel all the time. But it's defined for you in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. We've gone through that many times. And that how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. His death is the uh, the uh, thing that makes it possible for you and I to be saved. And his qualifications for that death, which of course I wouldn't demean. Let's move on. Okay, let's just jump in. Le- Leviticus, that's all, that's all sort of a warm up and a review from last time. Let's jump into Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1. And the Lord called, that gives the book its name, and the Lord called unto Moses, oh, let me back up so you don't get confused. That's the Hebrew name for it. The Septuagint translators contrived a, uh, a word in the Greek to represent the Levites. That's the book is so full of not only the priests, but also the Levites. The Levites is a broader term. You had to be a Levite to be a priest, but not all Levites were priests. You had to be a descendant of Aaron. So you have all the Levites and within, within that the priest, but there's much in this book, of course, that focuses on that. And for that reason, the, G, the Greek translators labeled the book uh, Leviticus, which is where we get our English label for it. Anyway, the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, and he goes on, most of this book is literally quotes from God himself. He's now no longer speaking from the mountain. He's speaking from the tabernacle. From the mountain, Moses uh, comes down and, and has his Ten Commandments, and he also has specifications for this portable sanctuary that we call the tabernacle. And they build it, put it together. And uh, uh, it, when that was assembled and sanctified, God speaks to Moses out of the tabernacle. Okay, he's the direct speaker. The Lord spake unto Moses. This is actually said 56 different times in the 27 chapters in front of us. This book is made up almost entirely of direct quotes, more than any other book of the Bible. Okay, verse 2. 
God says, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, if any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If any man, you know, realize the openness of this, any person, anyone, uh, at any time could bring a, an offering. This is uh, another way of saying whosoever will may come. There are two types of animals that are specified here. For the burnt offering. Animals of the herd are cattle, and of the flock are sheep. That's what the terminology really means. So we're talking cattle or sheep. What is excluded here are any animals of prey or carnivorous animals. See, it wouldn't do to have an animal that um, lives by the death of others to typify Christ. Every detail of this is intended to typify or point to uh, uh, Jesus Christ who became a ransom, of course, for all of us. And a further restriction was that the animal had to be a clean animal and it had to be domesticated. It was not an animal that could be taken in the hunt. Only that which was valuable and dear to its owner would operate here. And again, because it prefigures Christ. God spared not who? His own son. Each of these, by the way, are also horned animals. And in the ancient uh, uh, vernacular here, or or, or vocabulary, a horn uh, symbolized power and authority. What's also going to be portrayed here as we go forward is Jesus, of course, suffered on the cross, but the Father also suffered in heaven. That loss was not, you know, uh, removed. It was there. A final restriction on these animals is that the animal has one that had to be obedient to man. And Christ was, of course, the obedient servant. He came to minister and was obedient unto death. We're going to discover there are six parts to to every blood ritual. The presentation, the laying on of the hand, the killing of the victim, then the sprinkling of the blood, and then the burning. Those five will be present in the burnt offerings. In the rest of them, there's a sixth element called the sacrificial meal. There's no sacrificial meal with this one because it all gets burned up. Some of the others, they burn part of it and they, they, they feast on part of it. Not here. Everything, this is 100% goes up. And each one of these offerings that we're going to look at in the book of Leviticus will have um, uh, distinctives in it that will point to its unique features, its, its, its unique signification. Anyway, let's go to verse 3. If his offering uh, be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation uh, before the Lord. Sacrifice to be a male without blemish. And this, of course, too, speaks of the second Adam. Just as the first, by the first Adam came uh, uh, death by sin, the second Adam will deal, deal with that. And that's exactly the way the book of Romans uh, breaks that up. And we could go through a lot of verses on that, but I think that's familiar vocabulary to most of us. It has to be without blemish. It has to be the most perfect of its kind. God claims the best that we have. It's an impossible to induce, impu- uh, p- induce purity by anything impure. So this had to be perfect. There's going to be, uh, this is all going to be quite different in the peace offerings, which will typify the effects of Christ's sacrifice in the receiver, which may be imperfectly experienced by the sinner, even though the work itself is perfect. And we'll talk about that when we get there. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will. I want to focus on that for a minute. The offerer would bring the victim himself. This is distinctive here. The, the guy that's bringing the offering brings his offering himself. Um, the Hebrew phrase that's translated um, of his voluntary will, and indeed it was, but that's not really what the Hebrew uh, expresses. The Hebrew phrase there is better rendered that he may be accepted before the Lord. And see, by, by his bringing this offering, he is uh, signifying his acceptance of God's arrangements here. He's not just bringing the offering, he's also, in effect, putting himself under God's program. No one can do this for anyone else. You couldn't have a friend or a father or a son or something bring an offering on your behalf, not this kind of an offering. This is something you had to do for yourself. And the same thing is true of our reception and acceptance of Jesus Christ. We have to do it personally. Personally. 
And this, of course, uh, as one commentator puts it, says this is free will with a vengeance. It's equivalent to the term that Jesus used in John 7, if any man thirst, let him come. It's an open door for anyone that would participate. Anyone can choose to come to Christ if he so chooses. You don't have to come to Christ. But if you want to be saved, you will have to come to Christ. There's no other way. And you say that, well, gee, that sounds pretty dogmatic and pretty narrow. Yes, it is. But it works. <laughs> and uh, God made the place and he makes the rules. The door of the, and you brought the offering to the door of the tabernacle. It was the only way in. If you want to come to God, you must uh, come this one way because that's what God has established. The tabernacle had just this one entrance, and that's where you had to go. Um, and uh, you don't come to God on the basis of your righteousness. You're going to come to God on the basis of an innocent victim paying the way. Our righteousness is, is what? Filthy rags is the King James translation. The, the Hebrew term implies used menstrual cloths. That's graphic, isn't it? That's our righteousness. And uh, so you have to come to him. You have to come to God on his terms, not our own. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. But it's free for the receiving through faith in Christ. Verse 4. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering. And it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. This is an act of designation. As Kellogg put it so well, I think, this symbolizes a transfer according to God's merciful provision of an obligation to suffer for sin from the offeror to the innocent victim. Henceforth, the victim stood in the offeror's place and was dealt with accordingly. Putting the hands on the offering was a, a signified a transfer of, a, of responsibility. The offerer was thus confessing that he had, uh, uh, that he deserved to die. The little animal was dying in substitutionary death in the place of the offerer. And that's exactly what Christ did for us. You know, we take so much of this so for granted because we've heard so many sermons on the cross and so forth. This is God's demonstration of what it's really, what was really going on on the cross. When you designate Jesus as your Savior, He takes your place in your stead. And that's exactly what 2 Corinthians 5.21 and a bunch of other verses nail down. And the word here in the Hebrew is tzamak, which means to lean heavily or rest upon it. He, he, he leaned his hand on the head. It was, it, it implied, it, it was, it was a, a reliance, if you will, on that. It's the same word that's used in Psalm 88.7 to, to actually lean on it. And again, as I emphasized before, but I want to emphasize again, it's not possible for the blood of, of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's what Hebrews 10.4 says. Only the Lamb of God can take away sin. But all of this prefigures that. All of this points forward. And uh, so the offeror, having left his sins, conveyed to his victim, he now steps aside. That's all he has to do. He's done his part. The treatment of the victim is God's part. He's done it from here on. And this all is done publicly. He went down the tabernacle and the animal was slain in a public act. And uh, the sinner needs to confess Christ publicly. We often have an altar call, let people come down. But part of the whole procedure is an intent to make it a public declaration. And that's the primary reason for baptism today. That's the real uh, impact of, of the, the, the rite of baptism. Baptism means to be identified with, and it symbolizes our identity with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's the whole uh, idiom there. Again, emphasized by Paul in uh, his First Corinthians letter. Well, now we get to the ritual. All this is a preamble. Now we get to the ritual. And I should emphasize, of course, like even uh, uh, among the Jews, just like Christians today, much of these rituals can be very... Uh, Empty. They can be just going through the motions um, without putting our heart in it. And the same thing was true back then. Some of this obviously became ritualized. And yet uh, we need to be on the guard of that. God doesn't want our sacrifices. He wants obedience from our hearts. That's really what should be going on here. But there's a lot to learn from these details, just as Paul told us in Romans 15.4. Verse 5, And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord and the priest. Who does the killing here? He does. Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. 
He's transferred his obligation to suffer for his sins. He would bring his offering then to the entrance of the tabernacle publicly where he'd be met by the priest. But the sinner himself, in this case, in this particular one, would slay the victim. There is an exception when we use birds instead. We'll get to that in verses 14 and 15. There is a provision for the poor. There's no excuse not to give a burnt offering. Because if you couldn't afford to have the cattle uh, uh, you know, from, from the herd or from the flock, there was a provision for used birds. were inex- relative, you know, obviously relatively inexpensive. Mary and Joseph gave birds. Now come, we'll come to that in verse 14 and 15. But the sinner himself would slay the victim. Why? To demonstrate the wages of sin. What were the wages of sin? Death. And he has to participate in that. And uh, the, the presumption here, too, is that the offering, the, the innocent animal, the victim, is uh, d- of, of dear value to the offeror, not something casual, not something really expendable at all. That's the point. So the, if the model is really clear. The innocent here is dying for the guilty. And that's exactly what First Peter 3.18, probably in your Bible memory verse list, <laughs> for Christ hath... Uh, also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, and bring put to death in the flesh, but be quickened by the Spirit. You know, there's been a lot of discussion over the centuries as who is responsible for the death of Christ. Debates usually involve whether it was the religious leaders, the Jews in general, the Romans, what have you. You know whose fault it really was? Mine. My fault. And yours. It was our sins that put him on that cross. And only the blood of Christ can cleanse us from all sins. And so anyway, after slaying the victim, the priest took over by sprinkling the blood all about the altar. You say, gee, it sounds like a mess. Yes, it was. Deliberately so. The term for sprinkling, by the way, is tzarak, which means to scatter abundantly in large quantities. This wasn't a little tokel sprinkle. This was... Uh, intended to be a a a mess, very conspicuous, and uh, well, just as the, as as the uh, offeror relied on the priest to do all that, we do too. We leave it to our heavenly priest to act on our behalf before God. And of course, God is not the author of confusion. We say that so frequently. We need to really understand that. It's from First Corinthians fourteen. But everything had to be done decently and in order. And it's interesting to see how what happens next. The offering is now cut into pieces so that it can be totally exposed and also more easily consumed by the fire. Very practical on the one hand and probably idiomatic on the other. He's really laid open. Verse 6, he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into his pieces. Flayed. He's totally uncovered. There's a complete undoing. Nothing of him is protected from God's view. It's interesting how the inner life of Jesus Christ has been on inspection for 2,000 years. He's been examined more than any other person in history. <laughs> and still the question remains that he asks, who, who do men say that I am? Now, Peter Jennings can have his TV special manifesting his ignorance. Uh, we're indebted to John Ankerberg and that had a two hour video response to that by real experts but uh, who do men say that I am that I the son of man am and cut it into his pieces verse 6 says it was a deliberate and systematic procedure every stroke relentless and determined There's, there's an order to all of this Verse 7, And the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And the priest, that is Aaron's sons, shall lay uh, the parts, the head, the fat, in order upon the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar. The head and the fat. See, one is tend to be the inward, the other the outward. Psalm 37.20 says, But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs, and they shall consume into smoke, and they shall consume away. The fat really also, see, acts as fuel for the fire. It helps the, 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 uh, 
thing to be totally, totally consumed. Verse 9, And his inwards and his legs shall he wash with water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. There's that phrase again. See, again, we have the innards and the legs, the inward and the outward. Um, we can't give our bodies to the service of God without our hearts, or it's meaningless. And uh, the whole man must go. We speak of consecration. We need to understand this is really the definition of it. It means to be, to be consecrated means without reservation, the whole person, in and out the whole, the whole bit. That's what Jesus really includes in Matthew 10, 28, where Jesus says, Fear not them which can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. And again, it's washed simply to make sure that the offering is pure, it's clean. It's uh, just as Christ was the just for the unjust, he was taking our place. All was burnt. That's the main th- thrust in this offering as distinct from the others. Every, pe- every bit of it was burnt, went up and spoke. Um, the sinews, the horns, the bones, the hoof, the wool and the sheep's head, the hair on the goat's beard, and so forth and so on. Uh, verse 10, And if his offering be of the flocks, namely of the sheep or the goats, for a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring it a male without blemish. See, the previous remarks are really focusing on the presumption it was uh, a cattle or a bullock, whatever. And here we're talking about, okay, if it's, suppose it's a, a sheep or a goat. Again, it's a male without blemish. So, And this, of course, is uh, um, pretty straightforward, just as it was before. But it also reminds, of, 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 <laughs> reminds us of Isaiah 53, verse 7. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. As we, it, it, it's very instructive after going through this chapter to go back and read Psalm 22. Read Isaiah 53 and, and see the tie together. Verse 11. And he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord. And the priests, Aaron's son, shall sprinkle his blood round about upon the altar. This little verse fascinates me for a number of reasons. There are people that quibble about where Jesus' cross really stood. The Church of the uh, Holy Sepulchre, which is a traditional site picked by uh, Constantine's mother, I don't know how she became an expert, but anyway, um, is on the west side of Jerusalem. There are some scholars that uh, have a uh, contrive, in my opinion, a, a list of reasons why the cross really was on the Mount of Olives. And they have their reasons for trying to suggest that, primarily because uh, it's recorded that the temple veil was torn. They say, how could they see it unless they were on the Mount of Olives? Well, they may have known that without actually, you know, I mean, that could be tied together. So uh, that to me is pretty thin. The uh, uh, I believe that the, the cross stood on the exact spot that Abram offered Isaac, which was at the top of Mount Moriah, which is a ridge system. And the top of that ridge system is not the Temple Mount. The ridge system starts at about 600 meters above sea level, and it it rises between two valleys, the Kidron Valley to the east and the Teropian Valley on the west, which is beyond those valleys is the Mount of Olives on the east and the Mount Zion, which is the main part of Jerusalem today, on, on, on on the west side. But the ridge system rises, goes to a saddleback, which is a thrashing floor seam. That's where the temple is. But that's not the high point. That's about 741 meters above sea level. You go up another 60 meters, roughly. It happens to be 777 meters above sea level. And that's where we have a place called Golgotha. That's where the cross was. And uh, right next to that happens to be a a, a garden that has a cistern that's of a quarter of a million gallon capacity, which means the whole area was under one owner. And in that area, it's not an area of graves in general. There is a special stone grave that, uh, uh, without getting into all the detail, I, uh, I tend to believe is, was, not just representative, really was the, the, uh, the tomb of Jesus Christ. But what's interesting about that whole little excursion is, you know where all that is? It's on the north side of the city of Jerusalem. And I think it's interesting that um, they kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord and the priests and so forth. 
Strange that that's there. It doesn't, other things don't talk about the east, south, or west, but it mentions the north, and I think that's interesting. Uh, you can make something of that. I wouldn't build any big case on it. I just think it's an interesting observation. Verse 12. And he shall cut it into his pieces with his head and his fat, and the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire, which is on the altar. And again, we have the defenseless victim left without any kind of covering, laid open. And he shall wash the inward, innards and the legs with water, and the priest shall uh, bring it all and bur- bring it all and, build, uh, and burn it upon the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Cut in pieces and totally exposed. The sacrifice at this point, of course, is totally disfigured. It's a mass of disjointed bones and mangled flesh. When you read the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, remember to start a couple of verses earlier. The chapter breaks are man's division. The natural division is about three verses earlier. Isaiah 52, 13, 14, 15, in that area. Isaiah 52, 14 says, His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men, and so shall he sprinkle many nations, and so on. When you're familiar with the burnt offering of, out of Leviticus, and then you read Isaiah 52 and 53, the parallels are very, very graphic. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. That translation is deliberately altered by the King James translators because they didn't think you could handle the literal translation. Many of your study Bibles will have a footnote giving you the literal Hebrew, which basically says that he was beat so badly he no longer looked human. And I believe that may be part of the reason. You see, we do know that in his resurrection body, he still carries his scars. The nail prints in his hand and the wound on his side are his emblems of recognition to the disciples on the Emmaus Road and in the upper room and so forth. To Thomas, he exhibits them. But that all raises a strange question. Why do they need that? Couldn't they recognize him? The possibility is that he still has the scar tissue of his humiliation, which, of course, is his, at this point, his glory. And we have this offering made by fire. Many people, I think, go too far, and they try to make that fire emblematic of hell. And I don't, that, that does an injustice to the Lord. Fire represents the, the resistless power of God which sometimes destroys, as in Deuteronomy 9.3. It sometimes cleanses, it's like a refiner's fire. It sometimes purifies, as Malachi 3.3. 3. It sometimes consumes, in Deuteronomy 4, verse 24. Our God is a consuming fire, which is also quoted in Hebrews 12.29. So the fire, I think, is better, best understood as the power of God that one cannot resist. It is, it is final. It's a, fire is a cleansing agent, purifying agent. Refiner's fire, we often sing that during our worship time. The sacrifice of the burnt offering speaks to the total commitment of, the, of, the, of Christ to God. It speaks of His total commitment to God. Absolute consecration. Yes, there's a sense in which it is an example for us, but its focus is Christ Himself. And I think the reason there is so much phoniness in Christian service, we all see it everywhere, is that we're not serving God unless we're letting Him cleanse and purify our lives. That needs to be going on as a preamble. And uh, we need to deal with that. We have forgotten this matter of holiness today. We're so accommodated to this the grace of God that we fail to really acknowledge and recognize and deal with God's holiness and our need to be holy through Him. That perhaps is the the main thrust of this chapter. Total commitment. Well, now we get to the a little exception here. We've talked so far, the burnt offering is either a a bullock or a a, a male goat or a male sheep. And... uh, now we have 
a situation where suppose you can't afford it. If you're too poor to be able to bring a burnt offering, that means you what? You die in your sins? No, no, there's a provision. Poverty is no excuse for not bringing an offering to God. He's made a provision here. And what was considered the inexpensive path here, of course, is to use a bird. If the burnt sacrifice for his offering to the Lord be of fowls, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or young of young pigeons. So the bird could be substituted for an, a, a more expensive animal. They were not expensive because they probably weren't. They had no other economic value. There's not much, there's not, not, not much of a meal in a quail or a, a pigeon or something. Um, every time I think of that. There was a time in our lives when we lived in the penthouse of the Balboa Bay Club there in Newport Beach. And it was a convenient way uh, in our executive life to, to also host people because they had a nice upscale restaurant as part of the club environs that overlooked the yacht basin. And it was also the location in Newport Beach where all the big expensive yachts were. And uh, uh, one of the things that they offered on their menu that was one of the popular was, uh, it was, it was duck all orange. And that was very often if we had guests what they would eat. Well, something else, if you live in Newport Beach, you also know Newport Beach is a peninsula that shelters seven islands and about 10,000 boats. And the bane of every boat owner's existence who lives down their noses are the seagulls. Because, you know, they're, they're, you, can put, you can put all kinds of little tags and things on your, on your covering of your boat. It doesn't keep away. Some people put plastic owls that are supposed to work. They don't work. Um, <laughs> I can remember we had a storm. We we, we later uh, uh, in Newport Beach lived right on the water, had our own dock and all that, and right near the entrance of the of the of the harbor. And uh, one year, because of a southern swell, there was tremendous damage. We had a, we took green water on the living room wall actually, but they uh, it tore away a lot of the a lot of the, uh, the 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 docks and things that that stormy night. I remember. Our neighbor, two doors away, a guy named Irving Berg, dear guy, um, uh, uh, had purchased some plastic owls and gave them to his neighbors because the idea was if you put that up on your little fag post, so that will keep the, the, it's supposed to keep the seagulls away. Well, I can remember so vividly walking out that next morning, we were all walking out on our docks to see the damage from the storm. And, uh, uh, our our dock had been damaged, and the, the flagpole had been leaned over, and so forth. And but the owl was still attached to the top of the flagpole, and I was just making a small conversation. I says, "Well, Irv, at least one thing, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with your owls. I didn't realize you could, it could sustain the form." He yelled, <laughs> he yelled from the other dock, says, "You have never seen a Jewish owl before." <laughs> <laughs> but I started to say, uh, most uh, people down there. Um, uh, I understand that the you know, I just take for granted that pigeons are and, and seagulls are just a bane of a boat owner's existence. And uh, as we would, whenever we had a, a guest, especially from the Newport Beach area, for dinner and so forth, almost always they'd have some they'd order duck. And when they were about halfway through, I would turn the conversation and say, "Do you ever notice down here at the Balboa Bay Club? They have all these fancy. We're, you know, we're looking out the window, all these fancy yachts. Do you ever notice that around the Balboa Bay Club, there's never any uh, seagulls?" <laughs> they, would, they would be eating their duck. <laughs> They'd stop for a minute and think about that. And because most people down there know those two facts, have never connected the dots. There are never any seagulls around the bow boat. And the reason is, of course, is because boats are coming and going all night. There's always activity. So, so they don't really, But it, uh, it was always fun to watch them <laughs> connect the, the, uh, the, the dots. Which has got absolutely nothing to do with this verse, but it popped in my mind. <laughs> but... Uh, but anyway, birds uh, were in their economy more available, more inexpensive, and so they were the the uh, the offering of uh, of choice. I should put it that way, I guess, for the poor and the indigent. In fact, Mary and Joseph, we observe, offered um, uh, fowl in their offerings, which indicates they were obviously of of uh, very very poor uh, people. The Hebrew word here, by the way. Actually, uh, is um, Ben Yonah. Yonah, like Jonah. Jonah means dove. Ben Yonah is the son of the dove. The, the Hebrew word here is the son of the dove. And he, he too had to be a male, by the way. 
It's interesting that it was the dove that after the flood brought the olive branch, the message of peace. There's always an identity of the dove with, with peace because of the olive branch with Noah and so forth. Also in, in, the, in the New Testament um, idioms, we use the, the dove also as an emblem of the Holy Spirit because of his appearance uh, at Jesus' baptism. So it all ties together, obviously, as a as a, a message of peace. I don't want to say peace offering because that's a whole different category we're going to study. But uh, here, here the uh, turtle doves or the young pigeons uh, could be uh, uh, misconstrued as a peace offering. No, this is a burnt offering. This is totally consumed. In fact, verse 15, the priest shall bring it to the altar and wring it off its head. Now, in this case, it's the priest that does the execution, but that's an exception. Normally, the burnt offering, it's the offeror that comes and executes the uh, the victim. Uh, If it's a bird, the priest does it, rings off its head, putting this violent stroke on this emblem of peace, and burns it on the altar, and the blood thereof shall be wrung out at the side of the altar. Deliberately portraying it, the awful violence done to something so tender, so pure, so lovely. And again, we're reminded of Isaiah 53, 9. He had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. The contrast between the emblem of peace and the violence done to it is intentional. It's intentional. See, one thing that comes through, if you're actually in this culture, you're actually experiencing these things happening. It's a continual reminder of the awfulness of sin, the, the, I, the whole concept that sin has to be paid for, it can't be winked at, can't be sloughed over. It had to be dealt with. And the dealing with it was involved death and the shedding of blood. Verse 16, And he shall pluck away his crop with his feathers and cast it beside the altar on the east part uh, by the place of the ashes. The crop which contains the food uh, seems to be considered unclean because it is an emblem of appetites. And the feathers are removed because they are a covering of the doves. They strip away the covering in effect. Verse 17, And he shall cleave it with the wings thereof, but shall not divide it asunder. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar, and upon the wood that is upon the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. The cleaving, the word is shaka in the Hebrew. It implies a separation that's not complete. It's a term we would use as a, like a dislocation. Uh, not a disruption of the parts. And it's, it's correlative with a clause that he, in fact, he says it right here, but shall not divide it asunder. And uh, this is uh, also echoes John 19 at the cross. It says, For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him should not be broken. In Exodus chapter 12, at the Passover, in Exodus 12, we have uh, Moses receiving the instructions for that original Passover in Egypt. And uh, in verse 20, uh, 46 of chapter 12, uh, that they're not to break a bone of the Passover lamb. That's echoed again in Numbers 9, verse 12. It even shows up in Psalm twenty-two, fourteen, 14, and Psalm 34, 20. Not a bone of him should be broken. That identity is preserved in at least four places in the Old Testament. And of course, as we said earlier, the sweet savor was the very reason for the sacrifice. And this is what God sees in Jesus Christ. So you can actually get very strict in the understanding of this and recognize that this points to Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and from God's point of view, what he sees in Christ. The whole sacrifice was burned. I'm hammering that because that is the main distinctive of this particular bloody sacrifice as opposed to some of the others that we'll be looking at. This ritual was an outward rite corresponding to an inward experience. This was intended to be an act of worship. Not with some casual words, not with just some raised hands and some very poetic comments from a song. We call that worship. And I'm not disparaging it, don't misunderstand me. This worship was vivid. This was, these were real live animals that were precious to the offeror. It represented a, a, a very meaningful commitment on his part. It involved the death of something dear. This is an act of worship. Intense worship. Very painful worship. But a subtlety here, it was not so much Christ representing his people in his atoning death. That's going to come later in one of the other offerings. It's more a question of Christ representing his people in perfect consecration 
an entire self-surrender to God. In a word, perfect obedience. That's really what we should be carrying away from this. Christ's perfect obedience to his, to the Father. He's become the perfect example of what consecration to God really is. It's not part. You can't consecrate your right hand or your left hand or this or that. It's either all if it, or nothing if you're, if you're serious about it. Now we're going to, uh, uh, we'll, we'll set the burnt offering aside after this chapter. We're going to take it up again in chapter 6 in the sense of the priests. In chapter 6, we're going to, uh, 6 and 7, we're going to deal with uh, laws that have to do with the sacrifices broadly involving the priests. If you and I were in, that, uh, in, in Israel in those days, we might bring an offering to the tabernacle door, as is described here, on behalf of ourselves. And we could do that whenever we felt like it. Whenever there wasn't, it could be at any time. The place, of course, was the tabernacle door, but it was our at our voluntary commitment. That's the whole spirit of what's going on. In addition to that, the priests offered burnt offerings on behalf of the nation. See, we offered it. We take, we'd go through this whole routine that we just talked about on the basis of ourselves. We'd bring our lamb or whatever and 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 kill it and, and, as a as our uh, uh, worship to to uh, to God on our behalf. The priests were the representative of the nation, and so they offered it continually in the morning and at night. The fire never went out, and they were doing burnt offerings continually because on on behalf of the nation. It was not occasional. It was continuous. In fact, uh, uh, as one commentator puts it, every morning we should imitate the priest of old in putting away all that might dull the flame of our devotion. And morning by morning, when we arise, and evening by evening when we retire, by a solemn act of self-consecration, we should give ourselves anew to the Lord. You see, we're all uh, results of this altar call mentality. And I'm not disparaging it. I'm just trying to highlight its limitations. We go to some big meeting on a weekend or on an evening and we have a, a wonderful message by an articulate spokesman for the God who ends up eliciting from us a commitment to receive Jesus Christ. And we respond to that. And we go down, as I sometimes call it, go down the sawdust trail, down the tent, down to the stadium floor, whatever it is, to, to, to make that commitment. And uh, there's some very disturbing statistics about that. And I haven't checked them myself, but I know uh, my dear friend Ray Comfort has quite a message about this because he's taken the trouble to get into the statistics. And... Uh, if you do a study of these big evangelistic moves, you'll often discover that one year later, only a very small percentage of those people are going to church. Now, there's another side to that. There are many people that worship and have a, have a, a time of fellowship without necessarily uh, staying with a Sunday morning model. That's a whole other thing we can talk a little bit about. But there's a lot of people that uh, prefer just to meet in homes. During the week, leave the weekends free for family projects, and, and they, they still they still and they're serious. They're not. They're, it's not that they're immature. They're quite the kind of. They're very mature. They just have preferred a, 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 a different model of their of their walk. But but the point of getting back to the the, the evangelistic call, the tragedy of it in my mind is uh, uh, it's it's a little uh, problematic as to what the real ben- a fruit of that is. But many many people make their decision there, and that bears fruit, fruit for uh, further, and that's great. Um, but there's another thing I'm really driving at. There's a tendency for us as Christians to celebrate that receiving of Christ as some kind of climax. And that has its, that, that has its justifications, but it also has its dangers because it should be a beginning, not an ending. It's a launching, not a, not a climax. Um, I often ask a large audience, you know, how many of you are saved? And you know, virtually, obviously, all the hands go up. The politically correct response in the context I usually ask. Then I follow up with the question: Okay, great. What have you done with it? You're saved. You're, you say you're saved. Great. I'm saying, in effect, prove it. James hammers that in his epistle. Yeah, you say you have faith. 
I want to see your faith by your works. It's not that your works that save you. It's your works that demonstrate you really have the faith that saves. And that's what, as, as we, as we plunge into the book of Leviticus, as we try to appropriate the, what God has for us in these, in these ancient rituals, part of what we'll discover, I'm getting ahead of this a little bit because this really comes up more in chapter six and when the priests deal with this, but this whole idea of a burnt offering was done morning and night. I'm not saying we should, obviously our offering was Jesus Christ on the cross and we appropriate that ourselves. But we, uh, but in our own act of consecration, self-consecration, that's not a once and for all thing. That's a moment by moment continual renewal. And every morning, every night. And often during the day, I, it's a time I, I enjoy when I'm driving. Sometimes you have a drive. It's a neat play. You're by yourself. You can sing. No one has to laugh at your not Billy Key, you can, you can uh, just talk to the Lord. Share with him how you're feeling about stuff. And he wants to hear. And, uh, but whenever, the point is that certainly uh, when you first get up in the morning and we retire at night, uh, it's, it's, it's scriptural to indulge in a very solemn act of self-consecration. We renew ourselves once again to the Lord. See, the whole, this whole uh, study is intended to understand God's heart. Leviticus gives us, I think, an essential glimpse into his heart. And he changes not. God doesn't change. Now, uh, to sort of tie off this chapter, um, we find the distinctions of clean and unclean um, in Noah's day. You may hear you may hear me uh, emphasize that a lot, but I think it's very very profound. When when God calls Noah and tells him to what's you know to build the boat and so forth, He tells him to take two of every uh, uh, two of every animal, but seven of the unclean, and uh, excuse me, seven of the clean. And we infer that's for obviously for offerings, which He does give at the end. But um, the the very fact that God can talk to him in those terms tells me that these issues are. How should I put it? Indigenous with God. They're codified in Leviticus. They're codified under the days of Moses. But uh, we find uh, back in Noah's day, we find uh, even hints of it in Eden. We find uh, uh, Abraham in Abraham's day, the heifer, the goat, the turtle, and the pigeon are all mentioned in Genesis 15, verse 9. Um, the mentions of commandments, statutes, and laws, which is in Genesis 26, is parallel to Leviticus 26, the very idiom, the, the structure of it. And so then we begin to recognize that these fuller instructions in Leviticus are simply an expansion of what Adam first received when he had to leave Eden. So as we wrap this up, I want to emphasize that you know, some of us uh, think that sin is nothing, that God is too merciful, uh, too good and too merciful to punish it. Some questions to consider. Why has God chosen such awful, illustrations of his wrath consuming uh, it was consuming wrath um, on these things on it why has God ordained so much blood and death agony and burning as the only means of covering it no other procedure there's not an alternative procedure this is it Let's look at it another way. Why did God leave his own son to such unspeakable suffering when he was found among the guilty? Did God fail to love his son when he was in that dreadful extremity? How did God treat Jesus? I love the way J.A. Sice, he wrote before the Civil War, he said, uh, if the stroke invoked by sin so overwhelmed the soul of him whose voice could hush, hush a storm or stop the ocean's billows, nay, drive out the devils and raise the putrid dead, what shall be thy portion, helpless mortal? 
when that stroke comes to be visited on thee. If God did not spare his own son from an immolation like this, how can he spare you in your impenitence and unbelief? Tough question. So that uh, there remains one other particular to be noticed with regard to this atoning offering. And that's the perfect freedom with which any and everyone might avail himself of its benefits. The freedom here is, 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 is be noted. It was not confined to any special time. The notion of his own voluntary will was paramount. So let's get personal. God sees Christ as the only one who can satisfy him for your sins. Have you seen him like that? Do you have the sacrifice of Christ between you and your sins? Has his blood been shed that you might live? And have you trusted him today? Or are you still trying to bring your puny little self and your trite goodness to offer a truly holy God? We often think, gee, we have this attitude sometimes our sins are, are not so bad. That's because we have absolutely no grasp of our, not only our sins, we have no grasp of how holy He is. It's His majesty that creates the, uh, is part of the, 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 the uh, contradiction here. Anyway, God won't take that. He only accepts Christ, what Christ has done for you, and He counts righteousness of Christ as your righteousness. He has made this place, He writes the rules. Now, one of the things that we need to recognize as we go here, the book of Leviticus is for the saved. It is for the saved. And every one of us are just a heartbeat away from eternity. It's time for us to take him seriously. Well, we've gone through the first chapter. In the next session, we're going to take up the grain Offering or the meal offering, uh, the King James rendering of the, as as the meat offering is in our uh, vocabulary uh, uh, a uh, a contradiction in a sense. The term meat in the King James era was a broad term, not just meaning meat like we use it. We use it denotatively, they use it connotatively. Uh, so a better way to translate it would be the meal offerings or grain offerings. They're going to be different, so we'll take that next time and. Uh, one of the things that I encourage you to do as preparation for our next uh, gathering is to read chapters 2 through 7. The first seven chapters are all about the offerings, and we'll take them, we'll take chapters 2 and probably chapter 2 and 3, we'll take them in pairs, pick up the pace a little bit, because I see we were able to, I, I didn't think we would get through chapter 1 with any time to spare, and I, I must have missed a page of my notes or something, because we're, <laughs> but, uh, as I've been doing the research, I, I have uh, deliberately left Leviticus uh, for this time to do the research because I, I really wanted to get into it. And uh, I'm blessed with uh, having accumulated over the years a number of terrific texts. And so I have to tell you that I'm really enjoying doing the digging to try to understand. Uh, part of that understanding is to cut through some of the fanciful interpretations and to really stick with the biblical interpretations using Hebrews the book of Hebrews as the divine commentary on it. But uh, there are a number of commentators that, are, that really, uh, it's, just, it's so rich. And it's, but as I stand back, it startles me to really come to grips with the, the uh, depth of detail in the Scripture, how it all ties again to Jesus Christ. It's interesting, I've, I've said this over many years, and it's very true here too, that um, one way to, un to unravel what's going on is to put Christ right in the middle of it. And then suddenly everything ties together. And it's, it's astonishing to me to realize how uh, in all these ancient rituals, with all these details that the priest said to come by, and it's interesting, God didn't leave it very loose. He really specified uh, on the tabernacle the materials it was made of and how big, and all the details are spelled out precisely. And the priests' lives, the, what they wore, and how they, when they wore it. Uh, it. God is very, very specific in his demands. <laughs>
And I think there's a lesson in that too as we watch these rituals. Not that we should be, don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying we should be offering these things anymore. We're no longer under the law and, and Christ is. But we need to understand that God means what he says and says what he means. We need to understand that when Christ was on that cross, he was fulfilling more specifications than you and I have any grasp of. We're just seeing a few of these. But we begin to realize that the drama that's un- uh, unfolding there, the mission, that it was not a tragedy, it was an achievement. I uh, was really hit by that. You know, so often we think, you know, how tragic it was that the Son of God was crucified. He came to, and, and, and there's an aspect of that, of course, that was a tragic. But my point is that that, that was what he came for. That was his mission. And his, his, to, to qualify for that, to, to, to make it uh, effective for God's purpose involved an incredible detailed obedience. And uh, we so glibly talk about Christ as our example, and yet we have no, no grasp of, of uh, how completely and how thoroughly we need to be consecrated if we're really His. Now it doesn't ha- and it doesn't happen in a once and for all walking down the aisle. That starts a process, and uh, and it starts a good. And, and he that has begun a good work in you will perform it. And, and the wonderful passage in Philippians one six. Um, but again, we are on a journey, and but that journey should be taking us toward an increasing commitment and consecration to Him. And as we study these uh, details in Leviticus, uh, if nothing else, they should uh, give us a respect for God's requirements, what he expects of us.